Hi, I'm Kyle Bowlesby from Corn Ferry Sports. I'm here with Kim Record from UNC Greensboro and Terry Mahadra from Arkansas State University. And I uh, wanted to talk about managing first time uh, D1 head coaches. Uh, Terry, why don't you start us off? Um, describe the learning curve that first head time first time head coaches go through, particular basketball and football in their first year. Well, I mean, they're I, having had the privilege to hire them both, uh, they're different. Um, Football, you got to help really help them get their staff together. Obviously, is the most important thing for me, um, and I, I would imagine for a lot of ads is making sure that they're offering the right contracts, the right money, using the pool money, all that kind of stuff. That's first and foremost. From a basketball standpoint, it's really making sure they're in place because they're kind of the show, right. and uh, they rely on their assistant coaches. Same thing. You're, you're trying to get their help them get their assistants uh, assistants in in place, but really uh, the the periods are a little different from recruiting periods. And when you usually hire your basketball coach, you're right and uh, you get a little bit more time right. than you do football. So um, they're just they're just different. And, um, uh, you know, first time head coaches is really you're, you know, lots of times they have a lot of training, how to be coaches, X and O's, recruiting and all that kind of stuff, but leadership. Yeah, Talking cool. about leadership is really the key first time head coach. I've never right. been in that spot before. Is so I always tell our coaches to coach their coaches and I help coach our head coaches right. to be good leaders in their department and, and to communicate and, and don't hide things from us and try to, if you make a mistake on a hire, if you make a mistake in anything, a sign of good leader is admitting that, right. or as opposed to hiding it like, oh, I, I don't want to tell the AD, you know, right. I made a bad hire. No, tell us. You know what? Go ahead and move forward. I think you're exactly yeah. right. First time head coaches in any sport, um, we tend to forget that there's more to being a head coach yeah. uh, than just coaching. Uh, in fact, I think most would tell you that that's sort of what they least get to do. And so we throw them in this, into this job and really don't give them training in other areas, leadership being absolutely number one, budgeting, uh, staffing. I think that for any head coach, uh, first time head coach, you're getting your staff right is, is the key element right. to it. Um, and trying to have them understand the difference between hiring your friend and also hiring someone who's better than you are and recognizing what your, your challenges and your strengths are. So uh, I've been, uh, it's been important to me because being a first time athletic director, uh, giving opportunities. And so you see that uh, with giving opportunities to assistant coaches going to the head coach role, it's different. And it, and it can be challenging, but it's also a, a great sign of uh, being able to teach and lead yourself. How big of a difference is it between being an assistant coach and head coach? Talk about the different responsibilities that come with being a head coach and how that's... Uh that transformation has to happen from a leadership perspective. It's huge. As an assistant coach, you know, you're you're on the road, you're recruiting, you have very specific defined duties, mm -hmm. and that's sometimes one of the hardest thing for a head coach to give up, to be able to delegate mm -hmm. and to be able to uh, they think they know what they're going to do when they become a head coach, but when they step into that role, um, uh, things happen. Um, right. that they don't rec they don't know that are going to happen and so I think being able to take that step back and then um, being able to admit uh, when you're wrong mm -hmm. uh, uh, that sense of vulnerability and leadership does not go hand in hand with what you think about when you're gonna sit in that chair um, it's important to be able to say hey I need help right. during the hiring process that's one of my key uh, questions is how you're going to trans transfer yourself into that. If you're a football mm -hmm. coach to that CEO position, are you, you've been the coordinator, the offense coordinator, my particular coach, this last coach I hired, right. he's the offense coordinator and, and quarterbacks coach. And now you're hiring an offense coordinator. How are you going to handle that? He was up in the box for 17 years. How are you going to be on the field managing the game from a, now from the flip side, from, uh, from basketball, you now are the CEO. Right. You're not the, you're not, you are actually running the show on the floor. 
the head coaches run the show on the floor yeah. for basketball. It's the complete opposite. And you touched on yeah. this a little bit in your opening, but in terms of hiring a staff, do you yeah. trust the first-time head coach to make those hires, or do you guide them along the way? Well, I mean, he he makes recommendations, and, and uh, we talk about every person. Why, why, is, why is that person? And, and you know, when you hire a first-time head coach, and I've always been a big advocate, especially when it comes to football, um, because they have to coach the X and O's, and that, and that communication of coaching the players and being able to understand what you're trying to implement mm -hmm. is huge, is during the search process, I want to know who you're going to hire. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to know who you're going to hire, and I want to know the backup if you don't get that person. Mm -hmm. And that has worked well, and the last two guys that I've hired, they've got their – First, one person left after a month here and went back to North Carolina, and then he got this backup. So that also tells me a lot about the person you're hiring. If you know that the people that are accomplished coaches that will come work for them. Mm -hmm. I, I think the planning part, yeah. um, asking them who they, who they think they want to surround themselves with and why. And then um, it all goes back to, for all of us, at the end of the day, they're the head coach and who they hire, um, how they perform is going to go back to them. So I have not yet had to say to a coach, you absolutely cannot hire this person. But we talk about the pros and cons. And I've had coaches who have come back um, and said, you know, you were right. This mm -hmm. person wasn't the best fit for me at that point in time. Um, and that's part of the, the growth as well. And I, and I think nowadays, especially in football, and Kim will remember this when she was at Florida State, when you're hiring coordinators, they're so visible and they're so highly paid now that you may love the head coach, but you might have fan bases now have pick on coordinators. Right. So now that coordinator hire, now in the SEC they're paying million, millions of dollars to coordinators, they're as much on the hot seat as the head coach. And, you know, obviously the head coach hires them, but the ADs, and the administration and the chancellors, they're very involved because you're talking about a, you're one of the highest paid employees in your whole university system is an offensive or defensive coordinator. So, so if so. they've, as a head coach, never sat in the chair, how do you help them determine their strengths and weaknesses? Obviously, over the length of their career, they've discovered some of those, but they may not know where their weaknesses are, where they, you know, they may need to bring an experienced staff member on or not. How do you help them? kind of determine their strengths and weaknesses? I'm, I'm big on um, professional development at any level. Um, I've been fortunate. Uh, our head men's basketball coach has been there five years. Um, one of his strengths was his network, and he knows how to use it. Um, and I think that's important. I do believe in, uh, in reading on leadership. I don't require him to do that. Um, one of the things that he's particularly done a good job of, and I think for an athletic director, uh, this makes you feel good, is that at the end of the year, um, he self-assesses. Um, and we talk about, um, and it's about the honesty, because the relationship between an athletic director and a head coach is critical. Uh, their, their success is our success. Their lack of success mm -hmm. is our lack of success. Right. So it's, it's uh, uh, partnership, strategic relationship, um, where you have to be able to go in and um, I don't expect him to do my job. I'm not going to do his job. Um, but you have to have those conversations about these are areas that you need to get better in. And Which, then if you don't, or you don't listen, then, then sometimes you do have to make yeah, changes. and that's a good lead into the next question is, how do you help first time head coaches deal with the emotions of winning and losing in the high stakes game of intercollegiate athletics. Oh, my question? Yeah, we'll, we'll let you take it. <laughs> no, uh, well, I mean, I want to add something that she said. I think is really good. Is try when you're hiring a coach, you look at your profile, what you want, and you have to identify what might be a weakness before they arrive. Mm -hmm. I give you an example. Our head coach, one of the things we talked about, our head football coach, he was in the box for 17 years. So managing the sideline was one of the things we right. talked extensively about. Yeah. So identifying those, what you know you need a strong head coach to lead the sideline. We talked about that before he got on. Hey, what are you going to do? You haven't done it because you know what? He goes, I've, 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 I've talked to Larry Fedora. I've talked to this coach. I've talked to this coach about some of the mistakes they made. So they're, 
going back to professional development before it becomes a uh, read look at the symptoms before it becomes a problem mm -hmm. so we're trying to identify some symptoms first and uh, and so um, I think that's uh, really critical um, challenges you know this year we, we started zero and four I mean for our fan bases uh, you know having won uh, four conference championships in the last uh, six years and uh, with four different coaches and we started zero and four lost to an I hate to say an FCS team right. and then we you know what it's, it was about managing that process talking to them about leadership it wasn't about hammering them as what are we going to do to help fix this what's some of the leadership talking to the fan base mm -hmm. about we recognize there's an issue I put out a uh, I put out a, a you know a live video to all via Twitter saying I know there's an issue we need you more now right. through challenging times and we end up winning the conference and winning in the bowl game. So sort of zero and four, so which is, you know, I think it's not giving up on people really early and uh, communicating and not be kind of a, um, uh, you know, uh, adversarial type relationship. Right. Especially when you know you have a good coach. Right. Do you think it's fair um, to judge a coach nowadays on one to two years of progress? How do you go through your evaluation process is there a certain amount of years you're given? What are you looking for in the progress year over year? I, I, the answer is no. Um, one or two years, depending on where your program was, if it's a building program, if it's a sustaining program, I think you have to stay the course. Um, you have to have a plan. Um, uh, the influencers and the people who are important in your program, uh, you need to communicate um, uh, with them. Uh, but you also have to block out the noise um, 0 and 4. Uh, I remember with a first-time head coach, we were 1 and 4, and um, went to the Final Four in, in, in soccer. And so you have to give some leeway that there are going to be mistakes made. And in the sport of men's basketball uh, right now, with the number of students who are transferring, um, the you know what have you done for me lately? It's very very difficult to get something done in a, a very short window of time. Right. So I think it's block the noise um, and stay the course. And uh, nine times out of 10, you, you hope that you're, you've made the right decisions. And sometimes it's not a fit. Mm -hmm. And as athletic directors, we have to be willing to say, mm -hmm. we made a mistake. Right. Building it, off of that in the evaluation process of coaching success, what are you looking for to see if a coach is on the break of, of, of really winning and breaking through that, that ceiling or if they're stuck kind of in that doom loop? Well, you can kind of, I mean, you know, unfortunately, you know, going back, you know, adding, uh, answer that question, but adding her, to hers is it, you really, every school has its own unique culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of winning and how they want to win. And whether we as ADs believe that they're in the right direction and the progress, your your public opinion may not believe that. So you really have to identify where, you know, you have to be very communicative to your fan bases to really explain to them what's going on. I think basketball is different than football. Mm -hmm. very. I really I really do. I think that because they don't necessarily know the assistant coaches much. They're not, not everybody sitting in their room saying, I should have called a different play and all that kind of stuff. Everybody think, has all the answers. And so um, I, I really believe that, um, that uh, it's uh, – um, a little bit of a, a challenge to manage, but I think it all depends on your culture, and you have to recognize that and, 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 and identify your key stakeholders that need to be person that you constantly communicate with. Right. Kim, so. anything to add there? I, I think you, Terry yeah. said, it, said it best. Uh, your, your university culture dictates a lot, um, and that's why it's important that whomever you hire um, understand that culture and uh, what those goals are and how you expect the work to get done and evaluating consistently throughout the season and, and that doesn't mean you sit down with them and have an hour but if there are positives that they're that they're showing particularly for basketball sideline demeanor how you're talking with your kids um, give positive feedback and then there, if there are things that aren't going well a couple of technicals here mm -hmm. some feedback throughout as opposed to waiting till the end of the season when you may not be able to correct those right. things. Yeah, and that's a great point. You know, we had a game this year we had more personal fouls than I want to count than anybody wants to count. And I know it's and we had a nice conversation <laughs> after the game about that. Um, and you know look a coach doesn't want me to give up almost hundred yards in personal fouls. Uh, those are 
those were you know some issues and, and and guess what we only had one the rest of the year and that was you know was called on both sides but i mean i think all that kind of stuff is it's just you know based you know i, I think you really want to be careful about a full evaluation during the season i mean at least i, I don't really want to do that i mean just it's supportive so right. supportive you know if there's some issues you got technicals or some discipline issues you know, you can address it, something going on, on the sideline, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, or, or on the bench. But I think you got to be really cautious about your uh, full um, evaluation during the season. So. Absolutely. So. All right, Kim, Terry, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me today. That's good. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. It's great.